You feel happy now? Do you feel happy? Yes. Well, you must be because you have tears in your eyes. Oh. Is that a beautiful experience, would you say? I would say yes. Forget what you think you know about psychedelic drugs. It was the most peaceful, joyous, incredible, life-changing experience I've ever had. Acid, shrooms, LSD, they are making their way back into medicine as an alternative to prescription drugs. It's called microdosing, and it's a controversial yet growing trend among the Silicon Valley crowd. Tonight on The Why, Psychedelics 2.0. Good Tuesday evening, I'm Chance Seals with The Why. When you go to the doctor's office, they always check a few things. Standard routine procedure, blood pressure, weight, height, all that stuff. Have you noticed recently they've added a new item sometimes? They start asking how you feel, not just physically, but how you feel inside. I was just at the doctor for a cold. They asked me, do you feel agitated, restless, sad, tired? More than ever, medical professionals recognize that mental health is intimately connected to physical health. Over the years, we've begun hearing and talking a whole lot more about mental illness. Commercials on TV like this one uh, for Zoloft, they spell out some of the physiological causes for feeling down or feeling stressed. They capture that feeling of hopelessness. Plus, they give you a possible answer also. Some people call this the commercialization of medicine. They prefer to use either talk therapy, sitting down with a psychologist or a psychoanalyst, or they wanna do exercise, maybe vitamins. In reality, all of the above are the most helpful. The most effective course of treatment we've seen time and again is utilizing every tool, mental, physical, and chemical. But at this point, the chemical options are pretty limited, just a narrow range, usually of pills, pills like this one. When you're depressed, where do you wanna go? Nowhere. Who do you feel like seeing? No one. Depression hurts in so many ways. Sadness, loss of interest, anxiety. Cymbalta can help. Cymbalta is a prescription medication that treats many symptoms of depression. When you're in a dark place, that is a light at the end of the tunnel for you. Antidepressants have helped millions and millions of people live fuller lives. They're doing it right now. They've helped people in my own family. What we still don't know is exactly how they interact with our bodies or precisely what the long-term effects are gonna be with those. So it's a trade-off. Live life, feel engaged and hopeful or just try to do it on your own, feel better on your own. Now there's a third option that's beginning to open up and it's new to a lot of us who haven't been around since, you know, 60 years ago, psychedelics. Diana Baser beat ovarian cancer back in 2010 but the fear of it returning convinced her to volunteer for the study. In this treatment room, she was given the psilocybin and her life-changing trip began. I saw my fear and it was a black mass under my ribs. It wasn't the cancer, it was the fear itself. And it made me so mad. I was just, I was furious and I screamed at it to get out. And as soon as I did that, it was gone. Since then, Dinah's anxiety has never come back. Never. It's been years. She was part of a new round of research on drugs that have been around for decades, but are now usually associated in modern day life with stoners and dropouts, frankly. But back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, psychedelics were a promising new pharmaceutical drug all their own. Some were artificial, others like psilocybin are natural. One drug of particular interest right now is LSD, and it predates World War II. In the 1950s, medical researchers at USC, they ran this experiment we're about to show you. They tested the effects on a young man. They filmed the results. I wanna take you along three stops here on the trip that lasted five hours in all. What do you drink? How did it taste? It had no taste. How did it look? Colorless. Now, would you tell me your name, please? William Millark. And what is your address? 3540 the Paseo, Los Angeles, 65. And your age? 34. I want to feed off of, of this feeling, this joy, which seems to be coming from everything. 
but somehow I don't seem like I myself. I feel as though I'm several other people, and all of them better. <laughs> Do you feel happy? Yes. I well, you must be, because you have tears in your eyes. Oh. Is that a beautiful experience, would you say? I would say yes. That's how the test used to be done. Just one big dose, see how it goes. When the drugs leak from the lab to the streets, organizations like the U.S. Navy issued serious warnings like this. What do you have to know if you're thinking about taking it? First and foremost, perhaps, and maybe the one that you've read the most about, is that some people, and I can't tell you if I'm talking about one out of ten or one out of a hundred or one out of a hundred thousand, but some people will reach the peak of these mental effects right here, and they will stay there. From here on out, these people are insane. They are psychotic. It's no wonder that psychedelics became something to be feared. I'd be scared. I was reminded <laughs> in that video there of the coach from Mean Girls giving the lesson about sex and how it's going to kill you. You know, when behavior is reckless, when drug use is reckless and recreational, the outcome can be dire. We have seen that. But our focus tonight on the why is not in the street. It's in the lab. Doctors are now leading the charge to reintroduce psychedelics into the medical field, and many believe the outcome is far better for many patients than the pills you see on TV. Of course, some disagree. We're going to speak with someone who uses psychedelics for mental health. A doctor running clinical trials right now, and a reporter who's tracking the revolution. But first, how we got here. No, you're not hallucinating. Psychedelics are back. Not the 1960s, hippy-dippy, mind-expanding, anything goes, age of Aquarius. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This time, it's all scientific. New medical research points to promising treatment for psychiatric disorders, including depression, a disease the World Health Organization declared the leading cause of ill health worldwide. More than 300 million people live with it, an increase of more than 18% in 10 years. In a way, psychedelics are going back to the future, before the 60s ever sullied the name. In fact, there are three names you need to know if you want to begin to understand psychedelics. Albert Hoffman. A Swiss pharmaceutical chemist created LSD in 1938. Dr. Humphrey Osman, an English psychiatrist, coined the term psychedelic, which actually means mind manifesting, in 1957. Then Dr. Timothy Leary started the Harvard Psilocybin Project in 1960 to study the effects of psilocybin, the active ingredient found in magic mushrooms. He was fired for giving students psychedelics in 1962 but he did go on to become an evangelist for the drug. Between 1953 and the early 70s, the federal government, with taxpayer money, spent $4 million to pay for 116 studies of LSD and psilocybin involving more than 1,700 subjects. The psychedelics were tested on people living with psychiatric disorders ranging from alcoholism to schizophrenia. The results were mostly positive and promising. They called for more research, but that came to a screeching halt. Psychedelics, especially LSD, developed a certain reputation as a counterculture drug. You live here in this beautiful place. It could be Wonderland. And all you do is, is, is take those pep pills. Sleeping pills. LSD. And President Richard Nixon then signed the Controlled Substances Act in 1970, which prohibited the use for most any purpose, including research of these drugs. So much of what has been learned faded from psychiatry. Now, the FDA is clearing the way for new research under close supervision. There are trials for LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, ecstasy, and ayahuasca, a South American brew containing a hallucinogen known as DMT. Preliminary results again are encouraging. Once again, the drugs appear to help with eating disorders, OCD, major depression, including cases that didn't respond to traditional meds like Prozac. How do psychedelics work? That's always a question. Well, think of your brain as a switchboard where the wires have been plugged in for ever and they never got a refresh. This changes that. Some of them might not even be working at this point, shorting out. Psychedelics disconnect all the wires and give the switchboard, the brain, a break. 
Then the wires are reconnected, but in a different order that refreshes everything and gets it flowing. The Verge reports after a treatment, brain scans show there's more connectivity and integration in the brain, quote, suggesting that maybe psychedelics work by breaking down the old pattern and kickstarting the brain into a new one. At this point, your local MD does not have psychedelics just sitting on the shelf that they can hand you. Brains might be getting a jump start in these clinical trials, but national drug laws would need a hard reset before everyday patients could pursue this new wave, old school treatment. I wanted to speak with someone who's experienced the effects of psychedelics firsthand. DeAndre Miller told me they have helped manage his depression and anxiety. By the way, this is not under doctor's orders. So I asked him, how does he do it if he worries about the legal issues and what he hopes to see happen in the fields of medicine and mental health? Tell me, how do you personally mm -hmm. use psychedelics? Nowadays, I use them a lot more for spiritual purposes, meditation, and also to uh, help with my depression as well. Mm -hmm. Do you find it effective? It's open my mind and heart to, to so much and um, it's helped me understand myself mm -hmm. in relation to the world as well and how I can use that love to help with my depression. Here in the DC Psychedelic Society, which you're a part of, right? Correct. What do you find with people who are, who are in that group? We've got a large diversity of different people. We have young college students, but we also have parents and, and other professionals really? in the organization too. So anyone from like 20 year olds to 50, 60 year olds in there. Do you think that your story is common to theirs that maybe the first experience was experimental and then you actually found a benefit that kept you coming back? It's not chasing some high or just wanting to see colors and shapes and things like that. It's using them to transform your life for the better. Do you ever get worried that uh, you could fall into self-medication that doesn't fall under something like FDA approval and hasn't been tested safe? Okay. There's organizations out there that have testing kits available so you can know if your substance is you know, pure or impure. Um, but that's why I personally tend to stick to a lot of plant-based uh, substances just mm. because there's been um, a culture and, and history of indigenous people using these substances for uh, hundreds of thousands of years. We are seeing a lot of excitement in the medical community, in the psychedelic community yes, about yes. the possibilities, but obviously a lot of apprehension out there in society and about, you know, a mile away from here on Capitol Hill. I'd like to see organizations continue what they're doing with, uh, with MDMA clinical research and psilocybin research um, for treating depression, PTSD, uh, anxiety, things like that. Um, but I also like to see more um, kind of like retreat centers pop up. Hmm. Uh, this might be long term, this might be sure. like 20, 50 years uh, down the road, but kind of retreat centers where you can go for, for a weekend and maybe take a small dose of these substances and kind of help kind of give your life a little reset. As people start to become introduced to the concept of psychedelics as something that could be maybe more constructive, mm -hmm. perhaps one day. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest misperception that you would like to correct? That the people who do these substances are just like you and me. They're regular people and a lot of them are, for lack of a better quote, still in the closet. Mm -hmm. um, you might, they might be your coworkers or family members um, that are doing these substances and so everyone is on their own kind of healing path and so I think we just all need to be a little bit more accepting and open-minded towards that. While I was researching this segment tonight, one article popped out at me and it was uh, after talking to DeAndre, he said, you should look into this. It's from a site called Inverse Science. It cited a new study where patients are treated with LSD and scientists monitor their brains second by second. And look at this quote. This is what jumped out at me. Quote, under the influence of LSD, subjects' brains expressed a harmony of functional waves across various areas in a way that was not random. They call this repertoire expansion, suggesting that brain areas under the influence of LSD became connected to other areas that they don't usually work with. Furthermore, the way in which those connections formed was not random, but structured, suggesting that the brain was undergoing a reorganizational process rather than building links indiscriminately. 
you know, I told him that I admired him coming forward and talking about that because I told him, you know, honestly, most people hear psychedelics and they think people who are out there, way out there. And so for you to put your face on this and say it helps me personally, um, while some people may disagree, uh, is admirable. Uh, psychedelics are showing promise in the treatment of multiple conditions, anxiety, depression, trauma, PTSD, a whole range of conditions. I spoke with Dr. Kenneth Tupper, who's overseeing two clinical trials right now with psychedelics at the British Columbia Center on Substance Abuse. We talked about how the treatments work and what is still left to be learned. You know, we talk a lot about supervision when we talk about psychedelics. Could you tell me how that actually works in the lab or in the treatment room? Sure. So this is not a sort of take two and call us in the morning kind of uh, take home prescription. It's uh, uh, several sessions of preparatory therapy, uh, and this is for a selected patient group who've been uh, diagnosed with uh, moderate to severe uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we work with them for a period of time before uh, the drug-assisted session, uh, and then there's uh, a couple of the two to three sessions with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy where there's uh, a clinical team of two therapists working together, uh, overseeing um, the patient while they're undergoing the uh, experience of the MDMA um, drug effects, and then follow-up therapy as well to integrate uh, and process what comes up for, for them during their sessions. So they take that there while they're uh, surrounded by doctors, therapists, and, and then they can kind of process things that they've been through in hopes that what their brain rewires how it works through it or will actually let them process and release it? Yeah, the exact explanatory mechanisms are not yet well understood. Uh, you know, there's hypotheses, but certainly uh, the effects of MDMA uh, re reduce uh, sort of fear and emotional triggering when dealing with uh, memories of traumatic events. Uh, it helps to build a therapeutic alliance to uh, increase sort of social bonding uh, with the therapist team that builds trust and, and allows for you know, the processing of, of issues that um, you know, have led to the PTSD. Which is so interesting because in, in a clinical setting, it's very different than what most people think of when they hear psychedelics. Even someone taking uh, too much marijuana, like I'm freaking out, man, that this is something very different, that they're actually processing it instead. Sure, and this, this harkens back to the uh, original phase of research that was done in the 1950s and early 1960s, where most of these kinds of medications, actually MDMA wasn't uh, invented yet, but uh, drugs like LSD, psilocybin, were being studied for their therapeutic potential. Uh, and promising results were, were generated, um, but the non-medical use uh, and street um, led to legal action, legal um, policy changes that uh, effectively kept these medications out of the hands of scientists and doctors. Uh, didn't do so much to keep them off the street, uh, but essentially the research was shut down for a period of about 35 or 40 years. Is there a big risk of addiction? Uh, essentially, no. The the you know we've got the classification of a whole group of different kinds of substances under the sort of general label of drug or illegal drug. Uh, but the class of substances we're looking at here, drugs like psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca, uh, MDMA, are a much different sort of risk category with respect to chronic dependent patterns of use. What sort of results are you seeing right now in, in your lab with your patients? Sure. Well, we're actually just in the recruitment phase. We actually haven't treated anyone yet. Uh, there's been a small study that uh, was done about two years ago with six, six subjects, uh, and that the, the results from that were pooled with uh, other research done in the United States, where the uh, findings were uh, strong enough that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration declared MDMA-assisted therapy a breakthrough therapy, uh, meaning that it's highly promising and they're sort of fast-tracking uh, the path to phase three clinical trials, which is this next step towards making these uh, basically uh, legitimate med medication uh, for the treatment of PTSD. Let's talk more about where this is all headed. There's something called microdosing. I'd never heard that word before last week, so if you haven't heard it, don't worry. It's called microdosing. It could be used for mental health or for general pleasure. Apparently, it's really popular right now in Silicon Valley. Business Insider writes, Psychedelic microdosing differs from a trip treatment in that it involves taking tiny amounts of a psychedelic drug several times over a few days rather than a single full dose. They're too small to cause a trip, but large enough to uh, potentially affect thinking and creativity. Erin Broadwin writes about health and science at Business Insider. She talked with me about what's happening right now in the field of psychedelics what appears to be working, what is still questionable, plus the really big question, what's next? It really seems to me, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, that this is 
going a little more mainstream, at least the conversation about it is. A lot of these uses for psychedelics focus on depression and anxiety, and we've had no new depression medications in more than 30 years. 123 people, I think, was the last statistic that I saw die by suicide every day. And for people who are suicidal, even those good medications um, can be largely of no use. They take four to six weeks to work. Mm -hmm. So um, we're seeing some good candidates for future treatments. Again, the research is limited, mainly because psychedelics have been largely outlawed since 1966 in and the U.S. And beyond and that. Gold. Right, completely. Um, and some of, the, some of the good candidates that we're seeing uh, based on the limited studies that we do have are psilocybin, which is the psychoactive ingredient in magic mushrooms, uh, LSD or acid, MDMA, um, ayahuasca, and to a lesser extent, uh, the pseudo psychedelic ketamine. And yeah, sometimes what they're doing is they're going back over very, very uh, traumatic experiences and essentially reliving them in a safe environment where they're kind of allowed to be comfortable and allowed to talk through it. Um, and that gives, that appears to give people the space that they need to then reprocess the event in a healthy way. Where do you put psychedelics in terms of its potential with mental health? That's a really good question. Um, as a reporter who spent a year reporting in London and here in the U.S., I can definitely tell you that the view from London is a little bit more optimistic. I spoke to one researcher there, David Nutt, who's very well known in the field, and he is, firmly believes that psilocybin or shrooms are going to become legal in the next few years. Um, here, there's definitely a little bit more resistance to that. What avenues do you think are going to be hold the greatest possibility? I think um, one of the places that's going to hold the most potential is with people who have what's known as treatment-resistant depression, or TRD. It sounds a little fancy, but it's actually very basic. It essentially means that you aren't responding to any of the most common medications that are legal for depression, like the SSRIs we talked about earlier. Um, and for those people who really need something else, for, for whom um, you know these everyday medications just aren't cutting it, those are the people I think who are going to benefit the most from this. One researcher compared it to me as if you think about a person with depression, their brain, um, the activity patterns look like heavily, heavily trafficked freeways. Like if you think of Santa Monica at rush hour and essentially what uh, psychedelics are doing is they're sort of redirecting some of that traffic to less trafficked routes. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, they're breaking the cycle of really negative thoughts. If you had a friend or a family member, any loved one who said, listen, m my life is kind of not getting to where I want it to be. I just cannot conquer this mental health issue. Would you tell them to explore this? Would you recommend that they talk to a doctor about this? Or given what you know, would you say, maybe go another route? So that's a really hard question. Um, I actually, it's one that I grapple with pretty frequently because I get a lot of emails asking me that sometimes. And I think, you know, the best advice is always to talk to your doctor about it, uh, talk to a licensed medical professional about it. But, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, I mean, if you are interested in getting involved in a clinical trial, that's the best route. You can definitely sign up. There are dozens and dozens of studies happening all the time. Um, otherwise, you know, it's kind of the same old, same old, just wait and see. Just to reiterate on that final note, in this segment tonight, you've probably heard the word promising quite a bit. Many researchers think big things are ahead for psychedelics after 50 years in the medical wilderness. But for now, they're illegal. And no major medical organization recommends treating yourself with these. Always, 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 always talk to your doctor about anything related to your physical or your mental health.